tongue Clear as could be Till the planes hit the buildings And changed history They stood for an hour Once the damage was done But then suddenly crumbled Ten seconds they were gone There were cascading projections of steel into dust Looked like explosions, but it was not discussed. So I turn off the TV and shut out the lights. It's all just illusion, right in front of my eyes. Well, I'm not scared. Sharing the truth About 9-11 Now building number 7 Dropped the cleanest of all Yet the world still knows nothing Of this amazing free fall There was no real reason It wasn't hit by Yet you can't see the flames You see cascading projections of steel into dust Looks like demolition but it's never discussed So I turn off the TV And shut out the lights It's all just illusion I kind of had them truncate that because this is the actual second show of the year, but we're going to, as you see here, we've got it labeled uh, the seventh season, first episode, because we did a rerun last time. I had the most powerful toothache I've ever had. It, I couldn't do anything, but f I, for, for five days, I couldn't even sleep or eat. It, it was terrible. And I'm here to tell you about Obamacare in, from Oregon. It's the Oregon Health Plan benefits. Let's see. Welcome to the Oregon Health Plan. Dear Mr. Olson, your coverage starts January 1st. Okay. Well, January 1st was a holiday, and I couldn't call anybody to find out where to go, so I waited till January 2nd. And I dialed the phone and dialed the phone and dialed the phone and waited and dialed the phone and waited and dialed the phone and gave up. And January 3rd came and that was a Friday. And I dialed the phone and dialed the phone and dialed the phone and dialed the phone and waited. Then Saturday came and I was still hurting so badly I had to start canceling all the shows that I was doing, including my own. And I called up again and I got the recording that said that they weren't open again till Monday. So I sat there agonizing, waiting until Monday. Now Monday is the 5th, 6th. The 6th is Monday. Now already I've had health care, supposedly, for a week, just about. And by the way, here's a description of the, the health care. It includes basic services, including cleaning, filling, and extractions, urgent or immediate treatment, and then limited other services, which are not defined. And then down below it says laboratory, and x-rays are covered and all that. All right, well, I have this piece of paper with me. I finally get through to them on the first time the phone rings, I mean, the first time the phone answers is Tuesday the 7th, okay? So now that's a week. And it took me all day, I told them, hey, I would have, the recording said, if you have a problem, go to your healthcare provider, but you haven't assigned me one yet. 
And I said, so I need to be assigned one. If I have a choice, I want Kaiser and Kaiser Dental. Okay, so they fortunately were able to do that. They, so they said everything was okay. So Tuesday afternoon, they gave me the number to call up Kaiser Dental. So I did that to call up for an appointment. Their computers didn't show any change. They showed me on somebody else's health care. What was it? Uh, family Dental. They showed me on Family Dental. And they told me I had to go to Family Dental. I said, no, I changed it to Kaiser. Oh, God. And all this time, my tooth is just killing me. It's still killing me right now, but I have to do this show. So Tuesday afternoon, uh, f they finally find out, okay, we've got you covered. I mean, we finally found out, yes, you're on the Kaiser Health Plan. So I have this emergency that's been going on for a week, and the best they can do is give me an appointment on Thursday. Okay, so Thursday, I lost track of what it was, but it was just this last Thursday. And here we are at the 11th right now, the date of this show. I still haven't been helped because on Thursday when I went in there, they sat me down, took x-rays, and while they were out, I looked at the x-rays, and sure enough, a little black line around the roots showing the infection to even a layman, if they have any sense at all. And I said, does that mean my roots are infected on all right? Yeah, yes, it does. You're pretty good at reading those. He said, well, big deal. You know, I, I said, so what? We can save it with a root canal, right? And they said, yeah, but you have some bone loss, which you might have to address. And I said, okay, well, let's do it. And they said, well, we're not, we, we can't treat you. And I what? You can't treat me? Why not? Because although I was enrolled, they had no idea what the coverage was. They didn't have any idea what the Oregon Health Share, let's see, what do they call it? The Oregon Health Plan, Oregon Health Share, I don't know. Where are we? Anyway. Welcome to the Oregon Health Plan. So they didn't have any idea what the coverage was. They didn't know if I had peasant coverage, which would mean they just yank the tooth and say, get out and leave me without being able to chew. Or do I have the uh, uh, United States congressman type coverage where they actually try to fix your problem and leave you with a healthy tooth, or at least a tooth on the way to health. They didn't do that. And so yesterday, I tried to call and tried to call and tried to call to, because they wanted, you know, I had to call up and find out if they found out if I have the right coverage or what and what are they going to do. And the phone didn't even answer the whole time. Bop, 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 busy. And so here it is Saturday. I haven't contacted anybody. I don't know anything about it. And guess what? The fee for this wonderful service that they're giving me is going to double next year. All right. Okay, but that isn't the end of the story. Since they couldn't cover me, they told me that I owe them $162 for the service where I go in and they tell me they can't help me. $162. Thank you very much, Oregon Health Plan, you piece of feces. Okay, well, enough said. And this is the, the seventh year, the beginning of the seventh year doing the show about 9-11 being an inside job. And... You know, there are still people that don't get it. They don't understand that that was a coup d'etat. They don't understand the ramifications. Everything you're seeing right now, allowing this whole economic transfer of wealth came from 9-11. Well, we're going to show a, 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 a recap of the architects and engineers participated along with 40 other organizations. I might be wrong on that number, but anyway, a, a number of organizations got together to form a group called Rethink 9-11. And here's the recap from the year 2013 that shows you some of the progress we've made. So go ahead and take it away. For 12 years, our policies have been based on false information, and we don't want to live in that world. We want our policies to be based on sound evidence. Did you know a third tower fell on 9-11? World Trade Center Building 7 is a 47-story skyscraper that collapsed late in the afternoon of September 11th. And although there was media coverage of it when it happened, 
there's been very little attention given to it since that day. I think we have all the story, two big towers, and then like whatever else got beat up around it. Right, know? yeah, exactly. Is there something we don't know? Unlike all the other anomalies of 9-11, which are difficult to piece together, Building 7 collapsed at free fall, and it wasn't hit by a plane. Wall Trade Center 7 collapsed because of fires fueled by office furnishings. And if the official story is true, this is the first time in history that a steel frame skyscraper has collapsed, supposedly due to fires. It's impossible for a 47-story skyscraper to collapse symmetrically unless all the columns have been removed simultaneously on each floor. The only way that a building can accelerate as it collapses is by having pre-engineered, precisely timed and precisely placed explosives. In other words, controlled demolition. Molten steel running down the channel rails. When people first start learning that the official story of 9-11 doesn't add up, it can be a very frightening experience. And I think the power of Rethink 9-11 is that it shows them that it's okay. That once they get over that initial shock, there's a vision for how we can address this issue. If everyone in the United States sees the collapse of Building 7, there will be widespread outcry for a new investigation. Rethink 9-11 is a global ad campaign with grassroots actions all across the planet. People around the world are starting to get it, but the mainstream media in the US is not covering this issue. And so it's up to us to put the issue in front of the people. So on September 11th, we had events happening all day in New York City. Richard Gage and a lot of our supporters started off at Ground Zero, then they went to the New York City Council, which is just up the street from Ground Zero, and dropped off pamphlets and information to New York City's 51 council members. From there, they went to Democracy Now!, then they went to The New York Times, Fox News, NBC, MSNBC, CBS, BBC. They're making it known to these news organizations that this issue is not going away. It's actually only getting bigger. Rethink 9-11. It's a global campaign that spans from Australia to Canada, from San Francisco to right here in New York City. And we think that if most of the public becomes aware of Building 7's collapse, that more and more people will start to question uh, what we've been told, and more and more people will start looking into the huge body of evidence that has been assembled, which shows that the official account can't be true. Extra, extra, read all about it. Have you heard of Building 7 before? Check out our billboard on the corner. The story the Times missed. Rethink 911.org, guys. Extra, extra. 2,000 architects and engineers proven that Building 7 was brought down in controlled demolition. Have a nice day. The story of Building 7 has been swept under the rug by the media. And that's why we are buying ads and we are making videos and sharing them. All we need to do is to keep the ball rolling. Sign the petition at rethink911.org. Donate to the campaign if you can to keep the ads going. On our own, we don't have a whole lot of power, but if we work together, we can raise awareness. We can do what the media is not doing. Share this video, sign our petition, donate if you can. Together we can do this. Okay, well, well welcome back to my free speech zone. And uh, you can see that uh, I'm still tongue in cheeking it about the 2004 Republican convention where they herded everybody that was protesting into this uh, toxically condemned warehouse area with, with this type of chain wire or whatever you want to call it, razor wire around it. And they called that a free speech zone. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about whenever I'm here is, I mean, this will be my free speech zone and yours too when we open it up for calls, uh, if I get around to that. I don't exactly feel very chatty. My tooth is killing me. I can hardly wait for the show to end so I can just go lie down. And even that won't help. But at least I'll have less to do. 
But anyway, um, we I ran across this great little clip here that's coming up, and it's, uh, you know, who diverted the, the planes? You know, we heard about all the fighter jets that we had and their capabilities of meeting people in a few seconds or a few minutes from the time that they uh, stopped responding to the uh, traffic controllers. Uh, and they always bring up that, you know, that, that golfer who had his, I guess their jet depressurized and they all passed out and the jet just flew straight until it crashed. But within 12 minutes, they had a pair of fighter jets flanking it. And that's when we first found out that there didn't seem to be anybody conscious aboard anymore. There's nothing they could do, just let it crash. Well, uh, but at least they met it within 12 minutes. Well, we're talking about over an hour and they still couldn't find these planes. So we're going to run this video and, and maybe this will help enlighten some of us about what happened with the planes. Through all this is history now. With more than 10 years having passed by, some crucial questions remain unresolved. You might have heard that the air defense on 9-11 failed completely. The official explanation is that nobody imagined something like this and that the military therefore had to improvise. However, the facts don't back this claim. On the contrary, the flight routes of the fighter jets show a pattern of deliberate diversion. Let's remember. Four planes were hijacked. After the first crash into the World Trade Center, fighter jets were scrambled. But evidence suggests that these fighters were diverted from New York as plane number two approached the city. Furthermore, it's a proven fact that fighter jets were diverted again from Washington, just as plane number three approached the Pentagon and even once more, as plane number four was heading straight towards the Capitol. Who did this and why? To clarify, it will not be claimed here that fighter jets could have shot down those planes for there was no shoot-down order issued at the time. The real question is why they didn't even reach the airliners at all. Because if the fighters had reached those planes, we would at least know today who controlled them, which we still don't know for sure. Let's now look at the details. Two Air Force bases sent fighter jets while the hijackings occurred, Otis and Langley. As just mentioned, the fighters from both bases were diverted to fly detours, delaying their arrival over New York and Washington significantly. For better understanding, let's reconstruct first the combined flight paths of United 175, the second hijacked plane to crash into the World Trade Center, and the fighter jets starting from Otis. 814, United 175 takes off from Boston. 842, last radio communication with United 175, the hijacking starts in the following minutes. 847, United 175 changes transponder code twice. This timing is remarkable since American 11 had crashed into the World Trade Center just seconds before at 846. 851, United 175 deviates from assigned course. 852, fighter jets take off from Otis Air Force Base following an alert regarding the hijacking of American 11. 858, United 175 turns towards New York. 903. United 175 crashes into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. The Otis fighters' jets are still over the ocean, apparently out of reach. 909. Fighter jets turn to the east, away from New York. 913. Fighter jets turn second time, back towards New York. 925. Fighter jets reach New York. So far for the official account, now a few simple observations. First, the normal flight time from Otis to New York would be 10 to 12 minutes, according to the military. But at 9-11, as we just saw, the fighters needed 33 minutes instead. From 8.52 to 9.25, that's three times longer. Obviously, this had something to do with a strange loop over the ocean. As the loop was apparently flown only after the second crash into the World Trade Center, one could argue that the whole issue might be of little relevance. But let's hold on for a minute, we'll see if this is true. Second, we have no definitive account for the circumstances that led to this remarkable flight path. 
through there are tape recordings of most of the talk at the operations floor of NORAD's northeast air defense sector. The precise audio channels for the communication with the Otis fighter pilots were allegedly not recorded on 9-11. Even more disturbing, we have some indication that the timestamp of the radar reconstruction of the Otis flight path might be wrong, meaning the whole mission could possibly have been flown a few and important minutes earlier than officially claimed. The crucial point here is the time of the first alarm call to the military that morning. According to the 9-11 Commission, this was a call from Boston Air Traffic Control Center to NORAD's northeast sector at 8.38. Immediately after this, at about 8.39, Colin Scoggins, military liaison at Boston Center, called NORAD again to help them track American 11. In this call, Scoggins said, The plane is 20 miles south of Albany. The problem. This timing makes no sense. Because American 11 was already over 80 miles south of Albany at 8.39, as the official reconstruction by the National Transportation Safety Board shows. At the time, it was also much closer to New York than to Albany, meaning nobody would even mention Albany in connection with American 11 at 8.39. Several authors and journalists have asked Scoggins about this apparent contradiction to the official account. But he stays by his words, saying that this was puzzling him too, and there were a few minutes, quote, that never matched up. As Scoggins is a well-respected source, cited by many authors and also by the 9-11 Commission, we have to consider the possibility that the call was actually taking place earlier. We have to consider that it very likely took place when American 11 was really 20 miles south of Albany, which was at 8.31, meaning eight minutes earlier than officially claimed. This, by the way, would further mean that the whole military response to the hijacking, including the Otis scramble, took place that same eight minutes earlier. So that the first fighter jets on 9-11 might have started not at 8.52, but at 8.44 already. It's speculation, of course, or more correct, an educated guess. But anyway... Let's see how this would look like in connection with the flight pass of United 175. 844, fighter jets take off from Otis Air Force Base. 847, United 175 changes transponder code twice. 851, United 175 deviates from assigned course. 858, United 175 turns toward New York, fighter jets just a few minutes away. 901, fighter jets turn away from New York. 903, United 175 crashes into South Tower. 905, fighter jets turn second time back toward New York. 917, fighter jets reach New York. Now, this looks really troubling. If it happened like this, it would mean the fighters were turned away from New York right before the crash of United 175. Considering this, it's all the more disturbing to remember that the audio channels for the communication with the Otis fighter pilots were allegedly not recorded on 9 11 and that the Otis Jets cockpit voice recorder and heads-up display data were both, quote 9-11 commission staffer, not accurately timestamped. We have to ask, who diverted the jets? Now let's reconstruct the combined flight paths of American 77, the third hijacked plane to crash into the Pentagon, and the fighter jets starting from Langley. To make it clear, the following flight times represent the official account again. 8.20, American 77 takes off from Washington. 8.46, American 11 crashes into North Tower of the World Trade Center. 8.54, American 77 deviates from assigned course. 8.56, American 77 disappears from radar while slowly turning 180 degrees. 9.03, United 175 crashes into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. America is under attack. 9.09, Langley fighter jets on battle stations only, no scramble order. No fighter jet activity at Andrews, the airbase only 10 miles from Washington. 924. Langley fighter jets receive scramble order, but still no scramble order for Andrews jets. 927. Vice President Cheney receives message in the White House, the plane is 50 miles out. Still no scramble order to Andrews jets. 930. Fighter jets take off from Langley Air Force Base are diverted to the east over the ocean. 937. American 77 crashes into Pentagon. Fighter jets still fly wrong direction. 938. 
Fighter jets turn north one minute after Pentagon crash. 9.41. Fighter jets turn northwest towards Washington area. 9.50. Fighter jets turn southwest away from Washington. 9.59. Fighter jets reach Washington. Again, this looks really troubling. First, the fighters were sent wrong direction exactly till American 77 crashed into target. The official explanation by the 9-11 Commission says that air traffic controllers at Langley had sort of a standard flight plan, sending all jets generally to the east, and that this standardized eastern heading somehow replaced the original north scramble order. A doubtful claim. Because how should that have happened? The pilots knew the original scramble order, they knew which direction NORAD wanted them to fly. And then they somehow forgot? So again we have to ask, who diverted the fighter jets? Second, just as United 93 was approaching Washington, the Langley fighters were diverted again away from the capital. This episode is completely missing in the 9-11 Commission report, even though the detour is clearly visible on radar. 9-11 Commission staff member Miles Kara claimed in 2011 that a NORAD controller had just erroneously transposed two digits of the coordinates he gave to the Langley pilots that moment, 3825 North, 7702 West, instead of 3852 North. But anyway, this is in both cases a latitude way south of Washington, then why was such a new heading, diverting the fighters again from the capital, given it all at 950? The radar data made public through a FOIA request in 2007 shows a likely explanation. The start of a plane from Andrews at 944, circling over Washington and then flying south. As the radar picture shows, the Langley fighters were turning apparently to follow and intercept that plane. Again, neither the 9-11 Commission report nor Miles Kara identify or even mention that plane. As independent researchers found out via FOIA requests in 2008, it was a military Boeing 747, a so-called E-4B or doomsday plane. Why did the 9-11 Commission keep completely silent about this? And for what apparently classified purpose? Did this flying electronic command center actually take off, some 20 minutes after nationwide ground stop had been declared? To find out more about this, and to check the sources of this video, author read this article, Anomalies of the Air Defense on 9-11, published in October 2012 at the Journal of 9-11 Studies. Please share this video. Okay, uh, that's a good place to go, the Journal of 9-11 Studies. You should always consider that your first stop. And another good place is 911blogger.com. Uh, they always have somebody with their finger on the pulse of 9-11. Well, it would have been nice to have covered this. This is a, a video that came in uh, before my last show. I would have been showing it last week if I had, you know, shown up for for work as it were uh yeah my brother called me from idaho and or wyoming or wherever he was at the time and said when are you going to upload your show and uh didn't have the heart to tell him i didn't even have a show except for a replay but uh the issue was edward snowden having given all of his uh you know they, they say, some people say ill-gotten gains and some people say patriotically gotten gains. In other words, it's your duty. If you, if you see a crime in, in progress, it's your duty to say something or you're guilty of committing that crime too. I mean, that's an old Chinese saying that I modified into it because we don't operate that way, but we should. Uh, it, it boils down to the idea that here Snowden gave his... Uh, documents to people like Glenn Greenwald and others to quickly disperse but they aren't being quickly dispersed and that seems to have raised a whole another issue and then we hear about the billionaire behind PayPal offering to put up 250 billion a quarter or, or what was it 250 million a quarter of a billion dollars there that's what I got to get the levels right otherwise it's a bad story 
No, but a, qu a quarter of a million dollars, uh, I mean, a quarter of a billion dollars is, is a lot of money. It looks like Glenn Greenwald is setting up his business with uh, Jeremy Scahill and, and one other. And uh, it, it looks like, you know, he's using the documents he has to release as kind of trading power to get the billionaire to throw his money in. I mean, there's all kinds of speculation because billionaires typically aren't on the side of information and truth and justice. They, they're on the side of making more billions. And uh, if, if they're planning to somehow make billions from this venture of theirs over this release, that's a shameful thing. It's not Edward Snowden's fault, if it is. Anyway, think about the problem and Here's uh, James Corbett, who, remember, he lives in Japan, and he's going to be, uh, you know, setting up a, a two- or three-way video a lot of times with Sibel Edmonds on BoilingFrogsPost.com. Uh, but this is his own. It's a, about a 20-minute clip talking about Edward Snowden and Greenwald and PayPal and so on. And... Maybe this will help clarify some of the issues. <laughs> hey, well, we're going to start that right now. There it goes. <laughs> Despite what Time magazine would have us believe, there is no doubt that the most influential newsmaker of the year has been Edward Snowden a former CIA employee and NSA subcontractor who at the age of 29 became the unlikely center of global attention with his release of documents, allegedly detailing the inner workings of various NSA spying programs. Of the many intriguing aspects of this story, by far one of the most frustrating is that, other than a few interviews and press conferences, almost everything we know about Snowden, his motivations, and the documents themselves come from intermediaries who have found themselves in the position of spokespeople on the case. Even such basic questions as how many documents Snowden leaked is still unclear, with various sources listing anything from 10,000 to 1.7 million documents. If details as basic as these vary so widely between sources, how much more opaque are the more difficult questions of Snowden's motivations and intentions, let alone the specifics of any deals he may have made with journalists about how this data was to be disseminated? Questions about the practices of the journalists that Snowden has partnered with arose from the moment that the story broke. According to Washington Post reporter Barton Gelman's own account, he was the first to be contacted with Snowden's information. One of Snowden's conditions for working with Gelman was that the Post agree to publish the full text of the PRISM program presentation, a total of 42 slides, within 72 hours, along with a cryptographic key that Snowden could use to prove to foreign embassies that he was the source of the information. According to Gelman, when he could not promise to meet that demand, Snowden turned to Greenwald and The Guardian. Although several conflicting accounts of Snowden's early efforts to reach out to reporters have since been forwarded, it is interesting to note that The Guardian did not meet these demands either, publishing only four of the 41 prism slides. It wasn't until October of this year that Lamond published several more slides from the presentation, but to this day the full presentation has still not been released to the public, apparently in contradiction to Gelman's account of Snowden's intentions. In fact, similar questions surround the ongoing release of Snowden's documents. Who is deciding what documents to release and what documents to redact? Is there a time frame for the release of specific pieces of information? And if so, is this schedule being kept? Did Snowden himself have demands in regards to the release of these documents? Or, after demanding a certain time frame and method for release of the prison documents and finding that none of his journalist contacts would fulfill that agreement, did he merely hand over his entire document cache to them to release as they see fit? Again, we only have the word of the journalists themselves to answer these questions, meaning that we have no definitive answer at all. However, revelations continue to emerge about what is and what is not being published by the media partners who have acquired possession of these documents. We continue to publish stuff, but it's about 1% of what we were given. As far as I can see, uh, you've had 58,000 files, so you're telling this committee that only 1% of the information in those files has now gone public. Yes. After six months of reporting on the story, The Guardian has so far only published 1% of the files in its possession. According to a rough estimate published on Cryptome.org in November of this year, 
Out of a reported 50,000 pages, or files, not clear which, about 514 pages, 1%, have been released over five months beginning June 5, 2013. At this rate, 100 pages per month, it will take 42 years for full release. Snowden will be 72 years old. His reporters, hoarding secrets, all dead. Is this really what Snowden, or even the journalists themselves, intended to happen with this treasure trove of information? Can the glacial pace at which the documents are being released be justified by the state of disorganization or confusion that the massive data dump has caused for the story's reporters? Not according to Glenn Greenwald. Back in June, shortly after the initial reporting on the Snowden story in the prison program, Greenwald told BuzzFeed that the documents had been beautifully organized, almost to a scary degree. He then went on to imply that his reporting on the story would be over in a matter of months, telling journalist Jessica Testa, If I'm still working on these stories a year from now, I'll probably be in an asylum somewhere. So what changed? Why are we now six months into the Snowden story, and the public has still only seen 1% of the documents in question, or less, depending on how many documents there actually are? Has something come along in the meantime to persuade the crusading journalists who are so fearlessly reporting on this story to slow down and draw out their reporting? In mid-July of this year, just weeks after telling BuzzFeed that he was planning to finish his reporting on Snowden within the year, it was announced that he had signed a book deal with Metropolitan Books, a subsidiary of Henry Holt & Co., for an undisclosed sum. Although Greenwald's defenders bristle at the suggestion that the journalist is holding back documents from the public so he can sell them to the publisher, this aspect of the book deal is not even controversial. At the time of the announcement, Metropolitan Books promised that it would contain new revelations exposing the extraordinary cooperation of private industry with the U.S. intelligence community. In a recent Reuters article, Greenwald was even more specific. The book is about my time with Snowden in Hong Kong and reporting the story, but mostly about the surveillance state based on the documents I have that The Guardian doesn't, and my reasons why the surveillance state is menacing, he said in the Reuters piece. A bidding war is now taking place for the movie rights to the book, with the New York Times reporting that 20th Century Fox, Sony Pictures Entertainment, and HBO are all bidding on the project, although Greenwald assures Reuters that no deal has been struck yet. But for those who are concerned about the fact that Greenwald is hoarding documents in order to entice publishers and movie producers to bid up his projects, more concerning still are details of the new journalism venture that he is entering into with billionaire eBay magnate Pierre Omidyar. Glenn Greenwald has been a lightning rod for controversy since he obtained those secret NSA documents from Ed Snowden and published some of them in The Guardian. Now he's launching a media company backed by wealthy eBay founder Pierre Omidyar and running into harsh criticism from those who believe he is unfairly profiting from his access to Snowden. <laughs> Alan Rusbridger yeah. said um, they've perhaps released 1% of the information that Snowden got. Will you be releasing more of that? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, just to answer your initial question, um, you know, Pierre, Laura, Glenn, and I started having a series of conversations, communications uh, several months ago. Uh, Glenn and Laura and I were already talking about creating some kind of a, of a news site that we were going to use, not necessarily to replace what we do in our normal journalistic lives, but an additional outlet. And we were going to do a Kickstarter campaign based beg for money and maybe try to hire one or two young journalists who would work with us on it. And at that sort of moment, I was in Rio discussing this with Glenn, and um, and and then we get this email uh, from a mutual friend of Glenn's and uh, Pierre's, basically saying that Pierre, you know, is, is is working on starting this new news organization and wants to talk to you about possibly contributing. Uh, and that sort of kicked off this process. Then, where it was clear that Pierre's goal with this, which was to build an, a news organization that would have a an inherently adversarial posture toward the state and those in power, um, was in line with what we wanted to do. And um, you know, I. I in a million years, if you had told me a year ago, oh, you'll be working on a project with the founder of eBay, I would have, I, I think I would have laughed because it, 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 wouldn't, it, would, it would be sort of antithetical to everything I think would happen. But the question is again raised. If Greenwald has continued to hold back documents from The Guardian and other outlets for his own personal use, did he use the allure of those documents as bait to attract Omidyar's investment? Is he, in fact, selling Snowden's leaked documents to a billionaire? At this point, we have only speculation to go on. Very few details of Greenwald's agreement with Omidyar have been so far presented to the public, and unless some insider is to come forward with a leak, speculation of the specifics of their business partnership remain in the realm of speculation. But we do know that at the end of September, Greenwald and Scahill revealed that they were working on a groundbreaking story containing new details on the NSA's role in the U.S. assassination program gleaned from Greenwald's private stash of Snowden documents. 
Still teaming up to take down the NSA, journalists Glenn Greenwald and Jeremy Scahill have announced that they are working together to prepare a report on the National Security Agency's role in the so-called U.S. assassination program. Speaking to moviegoers at the Rio Film Festival in Brazil, Scahill announced the partnership and provided some details on the new project. However, neither Scahill nor Greenwald provided any evidence to support claims of the existence of the assassination programs or the NSA's role in it. So far, anyway. Two weeks later, the $250 million deal with Omidyar was announced and talk of the assassination program expose stopped. Three months later, no further details have been released about the story and whether or not it will appear as one of the first big ventures on Omidyar's new news venture. More worrying still is Pierre Omidyar's role in this saga. That this billionaire co-founder of eBay is suddenly so concerned with the state of journalism that he is willing to drop a quarter of a billion dollars purchasing the services of the very man who is sitting on a trove of tens of thousands, or more, NSA documents is odd, especially considering that Omidyar's record on civil liberties and his network's connections to the NSA and Booz Allen Hamilton are enough to raise serious red flags about his new venture. As principal shareholder and chairman of eBay, Omidyar controls eBay's child company, PayPal. PayPal has recently made headlines for prosecuting the so-called PayPal 14, the hacktivists who staged a virtual sit-in in protest of PayPal's decision to cut off WikiLeaks funding by organizing a denial-of-service attack on PayPal's website. PayPal was co-founded by Max Levchin, a dedicated NSA supporter. So I can't speak for Silicon Valley because I actually have a slightly different view of, of that specific issue, largely having to do with my immigrant origins. I am probably uncharacteristically pro-national security agencies, writ large and NSA in particular, Despite the fact that they would not hire me at some point, I actually wanted to work for the NSA, and I was not a U.S. citizen, and that sort of ended right there. Mm -hmm. But I really value my privacy, and I really value the government not knowing more than they absolutely must about me. But I also fundamentally believe that this country in particular so far has its citizenry's interests in mind that I just fundamentally trust the national security establishment to care about the citizens, to spy on the things that need spying. More worrying still, Sal Gambianco, one of the principal investment partners with the Omidyar network, actually sits on the board of advisors of Globant, a software company in which the Omidyar network and Booz Allen Hamilton, Snowden's former employer, are major shareholders. Philip Odin, one of the Booz Allen Hamilton board members, also sits on the board of directors of Globant. The Omidyar Network and Booz Allen Hamilton are also both major investors in Innocentive. Yet somehow none of these concerns are enough for Greenwald's most ardent supporters to even raise the question of how he is using his personal collection of leaked NSA files and who he is getting into bed with financially to do so. One truly independent media figure who has raised this question publicly in recent days is Sibel Edmonds of BoilingFrogsPost.com. In a recent series of articles, she has been reporting on the Greenwald, Omidyar, PayPal, NSA connection, and has exclusively reported that a retired NSA source is claiming that PayPal involvement in the NSA is explicitly mentioned in some of the documents that Greenwald has yet to share with the public. Greenwald has issued denials to the effect that he has not encountered any such information in the leaks, but has stated that he has no doubt that PayPal has a relationship with the NSA. However, to those presuming to ask questions about the possible conflict of interest of the lead NSA leak reporter teaming up with a man whose personal financial empire rests on a company that undoubtedly has a relationship with the NSA, Greenwald is surprisingly quick to issue ad hominem attacks and surprisingly slow to issue a substantive refutation of the concern. Now, a number of whistleblowers and journalists are lining up to voice their own concerns about the fact that the only two people in the world with access to the full treasure trove of Snowden documents Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras, are joining forces with billionaire Pierre Omidyar. So here we have, uh, for, you know, the, the marketing campaign for First Look, or, uh, about First Amendment and adversarial journalism and blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, today it costs relatively little to publish. If you look at the networked Fourth Estate, for example, that, that Bankler talked about in the Manning trial, the... Um, the combination of both pro-amateur, um, you know, serious 
um, journalists as well as nonprofits, as well as organizations like WikiLeaks and then larger media organizations, they all work in an, an ecosystem. If you look at the value of Manning's leaks, for example, it drove the cost down for Jeremy Scahill's book, Dirty Wars. So what Pierre's has essentially done, you know, we're talking about a theoretical structure here, by uh, blockading WikiLeaks, MasterCard, PayPal, and Visa have driven the cost up of publication that is naturally essentially free to distribute on the Internet. Um, so for me, the issue of a free press is not, you know, uh, how, how big is the, how many billionaires do I have funding my journalism? It's do I have the capacity to raise funds if I get li- um, brought up on charges for publishing suppressed information or all the other costs that come along with doing national security reporting and the like? So once again, you know, when uh, he responded to the question on the PayPal blockade, he was evasive. He, you know, tried to pawn it off on WikiLeaks, who is his competition, incidentally, uh, no matter how, which way you slice it. And that's competition is natural and fine. I'm just saying, like, let's like call a spade a spade right. um, and tried to say it was like WikiLeaks confusion. Well, it was WikiLeaks confusion. It was the Internet's confusion. It was Glenn Greenwald's confusion. It was the Freedom of the Press Organization's confusion. So um, once again, I think that what that revealed to me is that uh, – by his own words and actions in response to those two issues that I don't trust him. Well, uh, um, these kind of things are actually apropos. I think we, uh, celebrities have to take harsh criticism. It can't be uh, all adoration or, or loathing. But I think that um, uh, Sabelle has published a good critical article. Uh, we put up another one that uh, that it needs more research and more coverage in order that uh, the story not go completely off the chart into um, win or lose. I think there's a lot of nuance involved here, and uh, I think the nuance is helpful uh, because uh, it's hard to come by. And so I think that uh, Savelle did a great piece, and I think we'll see more of that. At one point, uh, Greenwald did great pieces of criticizing uh, celebrity politicians and others. Uh, and so I think he's quite familiar with what this is about. Unfortunately, he's gotten in a bad habit of lashing back at this almost in a petulant kind of way. But then celebrities do that. And, or either that or their agents tell them to do that because it pleases their fans. And Twitter, of course, is perfect for that mm. lash back. Mm. But uh, eventually I think he will uh, overcome that and stop um, uh, demeaning himself by being petulant. But it takes a while to, to develop the scar tissue required to not uh, be bothered by these seeming first glance as though they're personal attacks. But actually, I, uh, Sabelle's stuff went well below the surface, and it's long overdue, and I, th- I hope others will, 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 will emulate that. Of course, she's been heavily attacked for writing this article. Again, those who are pushing for a black and white approach to this um, you know, are actually quite destructive. And so that also is a warning shot uh, to others who might their challenge this kind of celebrity thing is that the fans go berserk. Now, so Omidyar's network, uh, Omidyar owns um, PayPal. He purchased PayPal through eBay in 2002. And um, there are a lot of executives that, uh, uh, young executives that ran PayPal at the time and, um, and became kind of the leaders in this uh, in the in the commercial side of the NSA spy, spying, really, um, one of them uh, being Peter Thiel, who is uh, a, a PayPal co-founder and who, along with a man named Alex Karp, um, created this company called Palantir, which is, uh, I would say, primarily the, the it's the major company behind providing technology to the NSA for spying for domestic surveillance, and so. These connections to these PayPal guys and, and the fact that Omidyar owns PayPal and is now essentially uh, funding the slow release of these NSA documents fr- that were stolen by uh, Edward Snowden, all of this um, should lead people to uh, responsibly and, but, and carefully question what's really going on because, you know, if, if, if the intent really was to provide documents uh, that 
and the American public needs to know about that, that shows what the NSA is doing, why can't they just do that instead of piecemeal? Frankly, there's only 900 documents approximately that have been revealed out of a number that just keeps changing. So there's a lot of questions about that. Glenn Greenwald has repeatedly ignored requests for comment for this video report, but has posted a lengthy response to such charges on his website in a post entitled Email Exchange with Reader over First Look and NSA Reporting. In the post, Greenwald bizarrely claims that his critics are forgetting that Laura Poitras also has access to the full set of Snowden documents, without noting that she is also joining Omidyar's $250 million operation. When he does address the issue of the blatant conflicts of interests in the situation, he writes, Ultimately, in terms of conflict of interest, how is this different from working with any other media outlet? Salon has very rich funders. Do you think I suppressed stories that conflicted with their business interests? Democracy Now! is funded by lots of rich people. Do you think Amy Goodman conceals big stories that would undermine the business interests of her funders? Although clearly intended as a rhetorical question meant to make the foundation funding of sources like Democracy Now! seem to be unproblematic, this is in fact an issue that has been addressed many times by outlets like BoilingFrogsPost.com and other commentators who are unhappy with the reporting of the likes of Amy Goodman. In the end, of course, only time will tell if Greenwald courageously works to expose the NSA PayPal linkages via his new Omidyar-sponsored position. Unfortunately for us, if that reporting proceeds at the current pace, most of the people watching this video will be dead before such a day ever comes. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com. Oops, got the wrong one here. I'll, I'll move over the other way. There we go. Oh, no, now you did it. Put, go ahead and put M3 behind me again. Yeah, there we go. Now you can see the... It, it'll work out. You know, I can compensate. Anyway, uh, yeah, so we're opening up the phone lines. They put M3 behind me, dude. There you go. And uh, we're going to go ahead and take a phone call. We only have about five or six minutes left, and I was going to start another video, but it's a 40-minute video, and it, we'd barely get going in it. And it's a replay of one I've already done. It was Larry Pinkney, P-I-N-K-N-E-N-E-Y, -I, -E -E I think, Pinkney. I might have spelled that wrong, but anyway, he was the information minister for the original Black Panthers, and uh, it was an excellent one to to have played, and I was going to do it. It looks like we have a phone call already, so hello, welcome to my show, and what do you have to say for yourself? I don't hear anything in here. Make sure you well, turn. What there you go. I hear it. I think I died. Okay, you're on. I hear you now. Everything's okay. Go for it. Say it again. <laughs> go ahead, caller. Are you here? <laughs> it, Hello. It, yeah, it, I hear Hello? you. Hello. Go ahead. Go ahead, caller. Hello. Are you here? You got to turn off your Hello? television in yeah, the I background. Hear. Hello. Go ahead, caller. Oh turn my. I'm Raymond. Turn off your TV. Hello? Yes, turn off your TV. I'm trying to call. Okay. Hello? Do you hear me? Yes, turn off your TV. I'm trying to call. I, my TV is off. Okay. You must not be sending my voice. I can't hear you. Look at aux 4 and turn up my mic on number 6. I, since I can't hear you, you can only hear me. Thank you for your work. <laughs> Thank you. I hear laughing. <laughs> okay, they must have got it up, so now they now you can hear me, right? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, good. Sorry, we we kind of set it up on the on the air there, but now it's all yours. And thank you for complimenting me, or thank you, oh. or whatever. But you are a breath of fresh air. Hey, I'm going to be on I, weekly every single Saturday from now on. Okay. I'm going to be with you because <laughs> cool. it's a lo it's a lone voice, and thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I don't see anybody and else covering these things. I appreciate all that uh, all that video that you showed. It's very complex. 
yeah. media and the internet and everything, most people can understand what they're saying, what they're doing. <laughs> it's not a it's not a clear voice right now. There's an overflow of information, but the fact that you're hanging in there with it, and th that video that you showed with the 9/11, I don't know, uh, you know, those, those the way the fighters were diverted. Oh yeah. You, uh, that was a may. I never saw that before. Yeah, it just you know either they're totally incompetent, and that's the theory that they give you—the total incompetence yeah. theory that they couldn't yeah. find him. You know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And while well, right. really, oh, thanks a lot. That's really all I want to say to you. Keep going. I'm with you. A lot of other people are with you, but we we stand in the shadows. Right on. Thank you. Okay, my man. Have a good one. I'll talk to you another we, time. We only have two minutes left, and so I just wanted to say a few things. You know, we're supposed to be the majority on a lot of things. In fact, we are. The polls are showing. and But it just doesn't make sense. Think about this. You know, who's really in charge? I mean, you, you know the answer to this. But back to the health care thing. Does it make any sense to anybody that you put a profit motive on health care? Does it make any sense at all? Absolutely not. You know, they, they talked about how terrible it was to have socialized medicine because you're, they, they ration the health care by time. You might have to wait too long to get your turn for that rare service that you need so badly, and you might die before you get it, but otherwise you have to wait your turn, right? That's way better, way, way better than the system we have. We ration also, but we ration by money. And then we don't let anybody have it. See, it's, that's the way this game is played. You have to have money to play the game, but you can't have any. That's the clue right there. You don't get to play the game without money, and you don't get to have the money. And so tell me how that's better for us. And... In the same vein, putting the profit motive on water systems, you're insane. Putting the profit motive on, you know, basic health, it doesn't make any sense. Ugh, it just doesn't make sense. Profit motive. You know, I've been around long enough that I can see the only thing the profit motive serves is the people making the profit. It doesn't serve any other thing. We don't want somebody who makes their bottom line profit. And somewhere down the line, if you benefit with a little bit better health, that's okay. But if you don't, that's okay too, because all we care about is the profit. And that's Obamacare, the Oregon Health Plan combined with it. But don't let them privatize your water. If you do, you're a fool. You're just a damn fool. Don't let them privatize your health care. If you do, you're just a damn fool. It's as simple as that. You know, stand up and tell your, your representatives that. And don't beat around the bush. Just tell them, if you privatize it, you're a damn fool. That's it. See you next Saturday.